All right, thanks a lot. Um, while you guys get comfy, I'm just going to kind of start talking because we have a full 30 minutes here to try and cram in global health in this short period of time. So I'm Dr. Jessica Everett. I'm also a family physician, uh, like your previous speaker, and I have dual roles. I am the executive director of Child Family Health International, which is a global health nonprofit that provides global health education programs for students from the undergraduate to postgraduate level. I also am a family physician, and I'm on faculty at UCSF in the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and on the American Board of Family Physicians Global Health Initiatives Board. So I want to start by thinking about the definition of global health, because it's a very broad term, and there's a lot of actual debate about the definition, and I think this debate is very rich fodder for us to actually consider what we're talking about here and what our position is as people sitting in a classroom in Davis, California um, in the global sphere. So one definition that has really taken hold is that of Jeff, Jeff Coplin and colleagues. Jeff is at Emory University and he um, and other founders of Consortium of Universities for Global Health define global health as the following. A field of study, research, and practice that places the priority of achieving equity and health for all people. Global health involves multiple disciplines within and beyond the health sciences, is a synthesis of population-based prevention with individual level care, promotes interdisciplinary collaboration, and emphasizes transnational health issues and determinants. At the same meeting, there was another definition put forth by a colleague from East Africa. And he said that global health is a concept fabricated by developed countries to explain what is regular practice in developing nations. I think it's important to really ponder the contrast and tensions between those two definitions, as well as how it is kind of um, accusing the global north or developed countries of using this term to explain what is other people's reality. And my thesis in part here today is that understanding that reality is really a key foundation to trying to contribute to global health gains in a sustainable sense. So I'm going to make three main points today. The first is, to understand global health, you need to get out of the hospital. And why do I say that? Well, I say that because data has shown, and this is a, a fairly well-known study in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, that only about 10% of whether people live or die is determined by what happens in a clinic or a hospital room. The other 90% are other determinants behavioral patterns being 40%, so social circumstances 15%, and environmental exposures 5%. And depending on the setting, some of these may be higher or lower for different populations, but this is kind of generalized across the board. So it's really important that we don't just put ourselves in that brown piece of the pie and that we understand the whole context. In addition, we know that health is housed within this larger context of an individual's community, social networks, living and working conditions, as well as broader socioeconomic, cultural, environmental, safety and security circumstances. And so in order to really understand how to impact health, we have to understand these broad determinants. The next point I want to make and encourage you to think about is don't fall for something is better than nothing myth. What do I mean by that? I'm going to tell you a little story. This is a picture of Malta Galpa, Nicaragua. And for a couple of years, medical students from um, a very well-known medical school um, in the Midwest were going to Malta Galpa because they had been under the impression that there was no healthcare there. So they were going and setting up a temporary clinic um, and doing what is pictured here, which is called duffel bag medicine and taking down medication, setting up temporary clinics, and treating as many patients as possible. Their school got a little concerned about what they were doing, and they, and they started talking to Child Family Health International, the organization I work with, to try and help facilitate a different model. But the important piece of the story is that when we looked in, the students and I, were, I was mentoring them, and when we looked at how many clinics were actually in this town that, where they thought there was no healthcare provision, there was actually 148 clinics in that town. So why did the students not think 
that there was health care happening? Why do they not think that these, this population was getting medical care or access? In part, I think it's because often clinics internationally in low and middle income countries look very different than what we're used to seeing. And we're always coming from our frame of reference. And so we all in this room probably have different frames of reference. But generally, if you've grown up in a high income country, the pictures on the right hand side of the screen are much more familiar to you as to what a hospital or a clinic looks like. These are actually pictures from that community where in the region there's 148 clinics and they don't look quite as clear cut or as gleaming and shiny and well, well signed as, as the ones we're used to. In addition, these are healthcare workers going out to bring women in to get cervical cancer screening um, and working at an established clinic that's operating year round and referring to the government healthcare system any cases that they find of precancerous or cancerous lesions. So healthcare can look very, very different than what it looks like to us. And so we land in a community where we've never been or maybe we've been once or we read about a community on a website where we think we want to go. We land and we look around and we see what we think is accurate, but often isn't. And so our challenge is to think about how we can see reality through the eyes of local populations to get a really accurate picture of what's going on. Because what happens is if we act on our inaccurate picture, we end up doing things that don't last, that cost a lot of money and don't have impact, or that actually can be pretty harmful. So when this medical school called me and asked me to help work with the students to integrate them into a more sustainable model, um, they came up with this schematic after we did this together, basically showing how you know, using an intermediate organization that has established community relationships, and I would argue integrating you into existing health systems that are permanent in structure, is really powerful. Rather than taking drug samples down that are written in English and are not consistent with the local formulary or the WHO essential medications in the country, the students didn't fill their, their suitcases with drugs. They came down equipped to work with the Ministry of Health to train lay, lay midwives on basic sterile birth techniques and recognition of maternal hemorrhage and fetal distress. And then subsequent to that, they evaluated their work and are now publishing it. The students really weren't, although they helped, they were not the main agents, which was really important. The main agent is Dr. Isabel Saucedo, who is with the Ministry of Health in Oaxaca. And she is facilitating the students engaging in this way and doing what we call capacity building, which is where you're training local healthcare workers to better care for their own populations. This issue has come up even in the lay press, and this is a spoof by The Onion. It says, new, quote, doctors without licenses provide program provides incompetent medical care to refugees. This is a real problem, and it's based in very good intentions that are executed in ways that are not as positive. I also want to bring to your attention that organized medicine and admissions committees are, um, there's an effort to, to educate and to standardize the way that admissions committees are looking at these activities. This is actually a uh, dental resolution, the American Dental Association's resolution that was passed in 2010 that begins to lay the groundwork for frowning very strongly upon any student who's applying to dental school who has ever done any dental procedures. So dental students, they are, in the, they are learning for 12 to 18 months before they ever pull a tooth. How many students in this room have heard of your friends going abroad to lower middle income countries and pulling a tooth? Okay, at least one of you. I've heard of many, many students doing it. So the American Dental Association wants to be very clear that if you're applying to dental school and you're doing these activities, it could potentially jeopardize your admission to dental school because it's considered unprofessional and unethical and unsafe. The Working Group on Global Activities by Students at Pre-Health Levels is a group that is trying to standardize medical, dental, and other health professions admissions committees vetting of global health activities, international service, and volunteering work. There's over 10 disciplines involved, 20 universities, as well as multiple global health education and service providers. Other best practices to be aware of the Forum on Education Abroad standards in this area, as well as the weight standards in this area that were developed for medical education. 
A resource that I would be remiss to not mention to you um, is the Global Ambassadors for Patient Safety module. So if anyone in this room or listening online is thinking of going abroad, this is really an essential pre-departure preparation to take. And it even has modules to help you select um, international experiences that have a high bar that's not going to get you or patients into trouble. In addition, they have an oath, and this oath is so important because once you're abroad and you're in a situation where someone may be dying, they may be bleeding, there may be a lot of distress, it's very hard to say no when you're asked to do things that you're not equipped to do. And so number one is working with organizations that aren't going to put you in that situation in the first place. But number two is having a tool such as this oath where you can say no without it being put on you completely and being clear that this is a boundary that's set upon you by the institution that you're coming from or by other best practices. And lastly, I want to share this important advocate. This is the son of uh, Zhao uh, Toasty and Katie Toasty, his name's John, and Atlanta's project is here today. And he has a onesie on that says, protect the vulnerable, only observe while shadowing abroad. This is an important lesson, an important message to not only hear for yourselves, but to take to your friends and colleagues. I want to leave you with a question about this issue, which has to do with opportunity costs. So opportunity costs are basically the benefits that you would have received by doing something differently or having alternative action. So my question to you to plant in your mind and to give you some, uh, something to think about is what are the opportunity costs of taking part in and learning from the example of suboptimal approaches to global health challenges? The third lesson today is Ebola is as much a symptom as it is a disease. What do you think I mean by that? Anyone? Yeah. It, it could be a symptom of uh, a culture or a country not having the, uh, the health care and the understanding of how to prevent disease. OK. And the threat of it. OK. It could be a symptom of that. Very good. What other things do people think? What else could Ebola be a symptom of? Any thoughts? Okay. Well, you, you know, Ebola can be a symptom of a lot of things, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but very much in the line that it is a symptom of a much larger problem and structural issues that exist. To look at the pathophysiology of Ebola, Ebola is a, a phylovirus, and it causes a hemorrhagic fever. And hemorrhagic means that you bleed, and it disrupts the clotting mechanisms. So people bleed. They bleed out of orifices, which is kind of the famous stereotypical dying of, of Ebola. Many people die, actually, of renal failure, kidney failure, um, because of damages to the kidneys and liver. But it's not just a virus. What Paul Farmer calls it is that this isn't a natural disaster. This is a terrorism of poverty. So Ebola can really be seen as a symptom of poverty and a symptom of lack of healthcare infrastructure and healthcare systems. It points out so many weaknesses in so many places, one of which is human resources for health. So this is a slide that um, I borrowed from Seed Global Health, which is Vanessa Carey's initiative out of Boston. And it has a quote from Bill Gates. He wrote an editorial that said, health systems, which encompass everything from rural clinics to community health workers to hospitals, are the best protection against epidemics. Paul Farmer has famously said that they need stuff, staff, space, and systems to adequately respond to the crisis. Ultimately, though, preventing and treating Ebola now or the next Ebola to come along is not about you and I going abroad and trying to do work ourselves. It's about building up native healthcare systems and building up supplies of doctors, nurses, community health workers, public health workers, health promoters, um, within countries. So here you see the ratio of physicians to 100,000 population. These are in three countries that are struck by Ebola. So in Guinea, it's 10 to 100,000, with 2.2 nurses and midwives to 100,000 population. In Liberia, it's 1.4 doctors to 100,000 patients. In Sierra Leone, it's 2.2 doctors per 100,000 patients. Who has a guess of how many, don't Google it, how many doctors per 100,000 patients in the US? Just throw out a number. No 
No guess? 100. 100. All right, good guess. 250 doctors per 100,000 patients in the United States. And people still write about the shortage that we have of doctors in our country, right? So it's not so much about exporting ourselves, although sometimes that's a temporizing measure that needs to happen, but it's about capacitating, which means having people who are skilled in country to do this work. What percentage of our residents in the US, graduate medical education, so residency after medical school, how many, what percentage do you think come from um, abroad, from men, many, mainly low, uh, middle and, low and middle income countries? What percentage would you guess? 35? 35? Any other guesses? 30? 40? 40? Good. So it's 26%. So the US healthcare system that has 250 doctors per 100,000 people, some of the highest ratios in the country, except for Cuba, has more, um, is pulling 26% of our resident physicians from other countries that all have lower ratios of doctor to patient. So there's both, you know, there's structural factors in our own backyard that need to shift, but there's also a lot of investment in health education and in making sure that people can make a living, be safe, and prosper while staying in their own country of origin or mixing between countries but providing appropriate care. Another reason we need to build health systems is because of the scope of non-communicable diseases. So non-communicable diseases, or abbreviated NCD, are diseases like cancer, diabetes, hypertension, diseases that you don't get by sneezing on someone or having sex with someone. And this is a graph that shows you the mortality projections from 2004 to 2030 of various causes. And you can see things like HIV are making a steady decline, TB is slightly declining, malaria is slightly declining. But what's really increasing? Cancer, ischemic heart disease, stroke. These are not diseases that you can cure with a temporary clinic, with a mobile clinic, with a drop-in once a month or once a year clinic. These are diseases that are only treated within health systems that have appropriate continuity of care. They're also not treated by drug samples that come out of my suitcase or your suitcase or anyone else's. They're treated by long-standing drugs that you can get every day of the year in your own language at the cost that you can afford because it's from your own country's formulary and is generic. So it's really important to think about what's hurting people in the world and how, what we need to do to address it. So who's heard of the Millennium Development Goals? One person? Two people? Three people. Okay. So Millennium Development Goals um, are goals that we've had for the last 20 years or so, 15 to 20 years, that were setting targets for a variety of different development agendas related to health. They're kind of coming to, a, to fruition now, and we've been analyzing the data. And the next thing on the heel of the Millennium Development Goals is this report called Global Health 2035. So it's important to hear it because it's something that's going to drive policy, drive investment, and drive global health action for many years to come. So Global Health 2035 is calling for this grand convergence. And some of the targets that they are targeting and going to be measuring to see if we're making that convergence are here. The first is reducing under five death rates per 1,000 live births to 16. So 16 per 1,000. The second one is decreasing the annual AIDS death per 100,000 populations to eight. And a third metric is to decrease the annual TB deaths per 100,000 populations to four. How are they going to achieve this? They're going to achieve it through many mechanisms, but one of the main ones is health systems building as well as universal health care coverage. So what does that mean? That means that poor people can get a core set of primary, health, primary care and basic health services without cost. And that you have this package that is essential for non-communicable diseases, which are the highest, have the highest morbidity and disability in the world. 
So it's not going to happen just by temporary band-aids. It's really about building health systems, making them more cost effective, and increasing access to care. This is Carl Taylor's free version of the Hippocratic Oath. So the Hippocratic Oath is an oath you take at the end of medical school. This is a version that Carl Taylor came up with, and Carl Taylor is one of the fathers of global health. He started the International Health Department at Johns Hopkins, which is one of the first in the United States. He said this, I will share the science and art by precept, by demonstration, and by every mode of teaching with other physicians, regardless of their natural, na national origin. I will tr try to help secure for the physicians in each country the esteem of their own people and through collaborative work, work, see that they get full credit. I will strive to eliminate sources of disease everywhere in the world and not merely set up barriers to spread of disease to my own people. I will work for the understanding of the diverse causes of disease, including social, economic, environmental. I will promote the well-being of mankind in all its aspects, not merely the bodily, with sympathy and consideration for people's culture and beliefs. I will strive to prevent painful and untimely death and also help parents to achieve a family size conforming to their desires and their ability to take care for their children. In my concern with the whole community, I will never forget the needs of its individual members. I, I, I know that's a high charge and I think the important thing about global health is recognizing that you don't have to do that in your first visit to a foreign community. You don't have to do that um, as a student. You don't have to do that as a licensed professional. This is a stepping stone process, and it's just really important if you are committed to social justice, committed to health equity, to start taking those steps and making sure that we're also laying down the foundations for steps for our colleagues that are from low and middle income countries to solve their own challenges and celebrate their own strengths. So on that, I just encourage everyone to let the world change you. I put my email up there, so if you want to talk about any of these topics further, do please reach out. And thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? We have a couple more minutes. So that's a great question. I just finished a study on what jobs are available in global health for people from the global north. And by global health, I mean in international settings, because global health is really you know, at home and abroad. But internationally, we did a study to look at what degrees were asked for. And 50% of the jobs were asking for MPHs specifically. Um, so I say that because if you have an MD, MPH, obviously that's going to um, meet that expectation. But I think if you're, like the previous speaker said, if you're not primarily inter interested in clinical practice or in individual patient care, you can spend those four to seven years, depending on if you do an advanced training in medicine, you can spend those actually developing your niche, either in public health or in health policy, or you know MBAs are another huge degree that is needed. You really need all sectors to solve these problems. So you know if we all the choir basically is all singing over here in public health and a little bit more in med and a little in medicine too. So you know there's there's a big argument to spreading our wings, getting out there, getting into corporate America, getting into um, you know economics, getting into uh, education because you know the need for training the trainers is so great so I think that it, unless you're interested in practicing medicine meaning seeing one patient at a time and doing clinical practice to some degree in your career that those years can be used better carving out your niche getting research under your belt getting experience in the field rather than just getting the MD to kind of have that accolade there's plenty of people who um, are going to defer I do think, though, that MPHs are a fairly common degree as well. So I think there is an argument to thinking about dual degrees like MPH, MBA, something that's shorter than an MD, um, to differentiate yourself if you're interested in that piece, like the business piece, or um, you know, if you're interested in 
uh, public administration piece, um, and or thinking of a doctors of public health, because that does kind of differentiate you um, from the group of like the masses of MPH students. There's just a lot of programs turning out a lot of MPHs, um, and there's a lot of online MPHs now, and so I think that if you can, I think doing something in addition, whether it's a fellowship or a degree granting program or, you know, very unique practice is going to be, is going to help you be employable for the long term. Yeah. So I work as a community college counselor. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the question, just to um, repeat it for everyone's um, ears, so the question is for community college students, a lot of times there's just thinking that like if you want to do medicine or health, you need to be a doctor or get the MD. Um, how would you explain public health and uh, for that matter, you know, like allied health, other health professions. Um, you know, I think that the field of medicine is actually fairly saturated with folks that want to do global health and people have a hard time actually getting jobs even with an MD in global health fields versus, you know, in global health, let's say in rehab or in um, rehabbing from traffic accidents. So traffic accidents are a major um, burden of disease in low and middle income countries due to road safety and poor infrastructure and a variety of things. So looking at rehabilitation is a big piece of that, right, of people who've gone through trauma. Well. PT, OTs, so physical therapists, occupational ther therapists, speech therapists who are doing global health or interested in global health or want to train the trainer in country are harder, are much harder to find than the doctors who want to do that kind of thing. So I would say partly it's that there's a lot of niches, there's a lot of opportunity in allied health fields um, to be globally active and to train cohorts of other folks in country or work in schools that are local um, or try to kind of do exchanges in that way. Um, and then secondly, the public health explanation, I mean, the way I would explain it is that public health is really population health. That's, those are very similar. I mean, it's, it's much broader than that, but public health is, is the doctor for a population, and medical doctor is really looking more at one patient at a time. I'm a family and community doctor, so my training is in the context of a wider community. Um, and family model, but many doctors are looking at more at one patient at a time, looking at biomedical diseases, and honestly, trying to bring in all the contextual stuff to a medical appointment is getting harder and harder because you have 10 minutes, 15 minutes, all these pressures on you. So if you really get satisfaction on a big scale, like I wanna change the way that tobacco policy is in, in California, or I wanna you know, roll out the, a the Accountable Care Act and, and get people access to insurance, if you're interested in that level of change, then public health is gonna be very gratifying, and clinical medicine might be rather frustrating. I think time's up. I will hang out for one minute, but I have an 11 o'clock in another building. Thank you so much, and take care.